Hey guys, welcome to July. I hope that everybody had a good June. To kick this month off, I am getting black pilled. I'm talking with one of these black pill dudes. This is actually the guy who did the video where he rated my face and judged my attractiveness to be a five out of 10. This is a guy from a community that believes everything about dating, it all comes down to looks. Anyway, after my video, reacting to his video, he reached out over email and he's actually a really interesting guy. So I wanted to talk to him. We have some points of agreement. We definitely have some points of disagreement, but it was a really interesting discussion. If you want to skip straight ahead to the interview, just go to this time here. This video interview is a special thank you to my Patreon community. You guys are so amazing. I am so appreciative of the support that you give me. You managed to keep me employed, keep me online, keep me making content. Honestly, without you guys, I would need to go and find something else to do. So thank you for giving me such fulfilling work, the best job in the world. So this interview is brought to you by my Patreon community. And since this is going to be such a long video anyway, I thought I might as well add a quick recap of all of the topics that I covered in June. So again, if you want to go straight to the interview, just go to this time here, but I recommend sticking around and hearing what are the topics that I've been discussing recently on my Patreon. My first video explores why women don't pay attention to men unless they are interested in them. Really fantastic insights into female psychology. You know, why women ignore ugly men? What kind of experiences have women had that caused them to be so standoffish? The next video explored whether or not women are interested in men who are stoic or if they have a good sense of humor. Because isn't there a contradiction? You know, women saying that, hey, I want a man who's fun and entertaining, but also reserved and mysterious. Well, I explained in the video that when you actually understand how a woman thinks and what she's attracted to, there isn't actually a contradiction here. My next video was just straight up practical advice, what to do if you're trying to date a woman with trust issues and when is it worth it and how to proceed. The next video was a long one. It was what legislative changes I would recommend that could reduce male anger. Really, really heavy stuff. We talk about divorce, custody, paternity, fraud, even a bit of abortion stuff. So if you're one of the guys who's interested in men's rights activism and that kind of, you know, social political stuff, you're really going to want to check out that video. My next video explored why I don't talk about female narcissists on this channel. And I talk about the complexity and overlap between what I call low quality women and women with personality disorders. This is more of a thorough sort of nuanced exploration of female psychology when it becomes problematic, as well as a look behind the scenes as to what my mindset is as to the strategy I have in my channel and why I think talking about female narcissists isn't actually going to help me achieve my goals. Then I did a video explaining why straight women enjoy the company of gay men. I talk about sexual safety. I also talk about judgment. I talk about some of the darker reasons why women would be attracted to the company of gay men. And I give practical advice on how to handle it if you're dating a girl and she has a gay best friend, you know, how are you meant to proceed from that? And finally, another advice video, what to do if you catch feelings for a woman when you're already in a relationship? How do you handle that situation maturely without shaming yourself, making yourself feel like there's something that you're doing that's wrong, you know, by noticing another woman is attractive or by having chemistry? How do you actually proceed in that situation? All of those videos are just from the last month. And so for just $5, you get access to all of them, plus every other video I've ever released on Patreon. $5. Honestly, the value is ridiculous. I know there's some guys out there who are reluctant to spend money on content. You know, they just want to consume the free stuff. But I really hope that you're able to bust out of that mindset and see that very little money buys you a whole lot. And it's not just the content. It's the community over there. After every video that I release, there's these long, thoughtful discussions in the comment sections. Men and women sharing their experiences, asking each other questions respectfully, with curiosity and intelligence. I'm honestly... I'm so proud of the community and the vibe that we have over there, and I'd love for you to be a part of it. Okay, without any further ado, let's get to the interview. Hello, everybody. This is a little bit of a departure from regular content, but we are going to have an interview. You guys may remember uh, quite recently, there was a video that um, was done by a guy who's my guest, Wheat Waffles, and he's breaking down my face. That's kind of what he does. He belongs to like the black pill sort of ideology. So I wanted to bring him in because that video was actually pretty heavily disliked as compared to regular. And I got some messages from people in my Patreon community saying that they didn't really like the way that I responded to that video. I also got lots of support as well, but I think there was the sense that I wasn't giving enough credibility uh, to the lookism and like the looks based stuff. And from my perspective, I, I very much think that that stuff's important. Anyway, this guy reached out to me. He seemed super nice, super friendly. Um, so I thought, let's bring him on. Let's have a chat. So Wheat Waffles, do you want to introduce yourself? 
Yeah, thanks. Oh, well, I think you already kind of did a good job of introducing me. So, um, yeah, so obviously, like I made the video with regard to Alexander Grace's um, face analysis, and like I run a like relatively small Blackpool channel at the moment, which is sitting around about two thousand eight hundred subs. Yeah, cool. So, I mean, good luck. Hopefully, it grows. So. The black pill, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but your perspective is that the biggest determining of dating success is going to be genetic, right? Yeah. So your looks, which are mainly determined by your genetics, is the like biggest factor. Yes. Now, I think that a lot of people who are inclined the same way that I am to look at biology and evolution are going to be thinking that that's absolutely obvious, you know, in the sense that your genetics, which is expressed in your looks, is going to have the biggest impact on your sort of dating success. And there's going to be a bit of a divide from that perspective from people who are more socially inclined, which are going to point to, you know, cultural factors and, um, you know, things that are sort of uh, created in your life, I suppose, like personality, um, strategies, tactics, pick up game, that sort of thing. Mm, yeah, yeah. So like, that's more like the red pill sort of argument that like, it's mainly about like using using your social skills, cues, abilities to like try to um, attract women. And like, that's where like I may, I quite like disagree with that. And like, there's data like to support it. And I've got plenty of like personal anecdotes and like the first personal anecdote that like kind of got me going into this whole sphere um, was that, like a few years ago, I was quite deep into like the sort of red pill pickup, like day game sort of thing. Like I learned all of the different techniques. Like I religiously watched like loads of different channels that um, taught you how to like, these are the best things to say, like make sure you're behaving like this and not this in, in, instead. So, and the thing that kind of like got me, kind of make like kind of flicked switches and made me doubt like the whole red pill sort of idea and maybe think that oh maybe it is something else like the black pill that is able to explain why women are attracted to the men that they were attracted to was because um so when i was in school this man um like you know as you do like was just like oh yeah hey wait I i'm talking to this girl at the moment uh yeah do you want to see her and like, I was like, oh yeah, come on, sounds good, sounds good. Um, so yeah, so he started like showing me a few pictures, showed for their text conversations. And the thing that really like startled me was that like the texting conversations looked absolutely nothing like what the red pill pickup artists were teaching. Like, and in fact, the messages that he was sending, they would be considered like cardinal sins by the red pill pickup and dating coaches. Like I'm talking good morning messages every single morning, good night messages every single night um like several times during the day he would be like oh yeah um how are you like how's things going what are you doing right now like how's things going and um he and i was like what so that stuff actually works like you serious like because i was stunned like i was like no way this guy who's showing so much um insecurity like by constantly pestering her um you know laying all the cards out on the table for her like exposing himself things like that I was like, no way this could have actually worked for him. Um, but like it did, like um, he still s saw her like a considerable amount of times, like and ended up going out, like forming a relationship. And like that kind of, that kind of like was the first like switch in my mind that thought, hmm, may maybe this whole pickup game sort of thing like doesn't really work. Yeah. I mean, I think, so I'm guessing he's really good looking, but um Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I would imagine. I didn't realize that, that at the time. I didn't realize that at the time. Like, but it's only after I discovered the black pill then I realized the things such as like height, um, having an aesthetic face, things like that, the genetic indicators of being a superior male. Yes, and but what what's happened, I suppose, is like. Um, uh, sorry, can I ask how how old are you? So I'm 20 years old. Oh. which i think might surprise a few <laughs> audience members yeah well good for you man you're, you're getting out there and um and making your points known and, and your presence made out there at a pretty young age that's impressive so i'm um, you're probably sick of, of older guys saying this to you but i'm a little bit older and so i've watched this sort of evolution of this my like beginning in all of this was like when i was 19 20 and we were learning from guys like um like the real social dynamics people like Neil Strauss, mystery method. These names probably don't mean anything to you. Yeah, no, I, I do know. I do recognize the names. Yeah. Okay. So that was my sort of um, first thing. So we saw like pickup artists way before like black pill, red pill, really anybody was talking about this. Like people didn't really look at the psychology of dating. It was just like, Hey, how do we get you a girlfriend? How do we get you laid? 
that sort of thing. And it ballooned into a pretty big industry because, you know, what people have discovered afterwards is the customer base for men, you know, who need to get a girlfriend or trying to get laid is massive. And so the potential for like people to come in and say, I'm going to teach you the secrets, how to get the girl of your dreams is massive. And people were found that like, you could actually find customers paying thousands and thousands of dollars to go on like a boot camp or to order your DVD series, because if they're that lonely, if they're that horny and some guy promises they've got the answer, they'll shell out like a huge amount of cash. But in order to keep that business model going, you couldn't focus too much on the look stuff. Like a little bit of like, hey, do your grooming, get some good clothes, work out. But largely, you know, looks are genetic. You know, there's only so much you can do to improve your appearance. And so I think economically, there was a financial incentive for that industry to focus less on appearances and more on the stuff that was actually what would you say, like in the control of the actual guys. And so what happened quite accidentally, I think, is that a lot of the content out there with regards to attracting women became focused on things that could be marketed in order to learn, which is why more money gets spent on like pickup like courses than just on like, hey, how to maintain like a good relationship, right? (laughs) You know, because that's not as sexy to, to do. So I don't know to what degree people actually believe um, you know, what's more important, you know, looks or game or anything like that. But I do think that there's a lot more money to be made in teaching game. And there's only a little bit of money to be made with like, like appearance advice. And so you see like a huge skewing towards that. What do you reckon about that? Yeah, I hundred percent agree. Um, like in my most recent video, like I actually spoke about how the red pill, like was able to set up this whole ideo- ideology and this business model, like, and obviously the way that they're able to do that is by selling hope to people because the thing with a black pill, like if you're told that your dating life is mostly determined by your genetics, then like there's nothing really to sell there. Like unless some surgeon like kind of tries to sell you like jaw surgery, like there's, there's not really much potential um, to like sell as opposed to like the red pill. And like kind of, and what I explained in my video is that the red pill has kind of like set up this system and like, it's actually like quite bad because they exploit the like most vulnerable people of society, um, the ones who aren't genetically good looking, the ones who are struggling the most with their dating life, uh, like the sub five men, the really unattractive people, because they're the people that are most desperate, uh, feeling the most lonely, and they like want to turn their dating life around, and they're their most pros- uh, profitable customers, unfortunately. Okay. Thanks for saying that. So let, let's talk about the elephant in the room because I think that possibly I may have been too harsh. Like I said, I rewatched that video that I made in response to you. And I was pretty cynical to sort of start off with because when I watched your video, I was like, oh man, this guy is really brutal. You know, like I don't really know like what guys are good looking. I feel like I can judge like a woman's attractiveness based on like how much, you know, I want to be close to her, you know, physically, but because I'm not attracted to men, it's hard for me to sort of know like, oh, this guy's really hot. You obviously know a lot more of that biological stuff, but it seemed to me my, my first sort of level reading of it was, oh, this guy, he makes money from telling people about, you know, they're really ugly, um, you know, or like you're really good looking, whatever, but like critiquing their faces. So I thought, okay, so his whole thing is exploiting guys like insecurities, like, oh, look, everyone's way uglier than they think that they are. You need my advice. And that was your business model. And mm. I'm guessing I, w- what I'm saying, I suppose I'm trying to say is that it would have been a lot more fair, I think, for me to actually reach out to you, which I'm going to do the opportunity now and actually explain why do you do the way that you do? Am I being too cynical in my approach? Like in your mind, you know, you just said like the red pill guys, you know, are exploiting men. And I actually don't disagree with that at all. But that's kind of the label that I put for you and that I've sort of put for like a lot of the black pill kind of guys. But I'm very open to being wrong. So why is my more cynical interpretation of what you do and that whole kind of movement? Why is that incorrect? Well, I think the main point that I disagree with you, like in that video, was that you said that like he's trying to um, lie to men, uh, telling that they're a lot, telling them that they're a lot more unattractive than they actually are. But that's like couldn't be further from the truth because, like, my ratings and analysis are like backed up like by science, and they are like the most accurate like sort of things that you can get, and that is literally what women will um, view your looks as, like as harsh as it sounds, because 
most men like being brought up like in quite a blue pilled sort of world like they're constantly getting validation like their feelings aren't ever going to get hurt and most men are constantly being told by women oh yeah you're good looking uh, there's nothing wrong with your looks like of course you're fine and most men actually think that they're about a seven to eight in looks even if they're far below that so when the first like so like if such as a man like such as yourself if you get told that you're actually less attractive that you're a five um then you know that that could like hurt the ego it could hurt like your feelings something like that um but that is how most um women like will view like different men okay so uh l- let me challenge you a little bit on that because it seems like I-, I know that you you think that your ratings are based on science but if you read the comment section of my video you'll see some people thought that was way uglier than you thought and they give me a rating far below and there were other people who put the rating like a lot higher to me although there are universally appreciated characteristics that are you know desirable to enough of the population to basically say it's an objective fact beauty is still inherently subjective And you must know this from chatting to your male friends that you guys don't always agree on what women are the most pretty. And so women are going to have specific types. And so for you to make a rating for people and to build a business model based on saying, this is what you are out of zero to 10 at this stage. And and please, I, I do want to be proven wrong. If there's something I'm missing here, it seems ridiculous to me because you're not taking into account this inherent subjectivity of people's attractiveness because there will be people who think that I'm very good looking and there'll be people who think that I'm really ugly. And I don't think just splitting the difference and saying, Oh, you're in the middle of that is like scientific. That's not how I think of it. So like when I produce my ratings, I usually go on the basis of what I would think most women like would rate uh, a specific man as like their sort of SMV. And like, there's always going to be like some element of subjectivity involved um, when women rate attractiveness because some women have different preferences as you say however like it is mostly objective so like in the example that you gave when men are rating different women like of course you know there there are always going to be some discrepancies so like you know some men are going to say oh is this woman a six is she a seven or is she a little bit something in between but by and large like it's it's pretty obvious to determine who the most attractive and the least attractive people are like there, there are like basic indicators such as things like height like it's obvious to see who's more attractive in in that respect like i'll I'll put it this way if you like take some old overweight balding man and you place him next to just like someone like you just an average person like it doesn't take a genius to work out like you don't even need science at that point to work out who's more attractive in that respect Okay, I'll, I mean, I obviously agree with that. It would be difficult to know. It'd be great to scan both of our brains and to find out to what degree we believe is subjective and to what degree it is objective. I'm guessing that I just place a greater amount of subjective weighting mm. to, to beauty because, I mean, and you just have to go based on your experience and maybe your experience has been different, but I have seen me and my male friends vastly differ in who we find attractive, like vastly. Mm. You know, women oh, who I go go near and some guys are tripping over. And also it takes into account the feedback I've received from my own appearance, which I spoke about in the video, which has been complete ends of the spectrum. And so from my, from my perspective, it would be difficult for me to adopt the weighting that you give to objective looks because it feels like it would be committing violence to my observed experience of reality. But I'm not disowning the possibility that I've just got a subjective bias and that perhaps how I've experienced life and what I've seen is unique. If you have genuinely experienced looks being that measurable and in all your conversations, you've found a huge level of predictability, it's not my place to say that you're wrong, but I think we need to account. It would be dishonest for me, honestly, to give my weighting to objectivity any more than I already have. Mm, yeah so the way i put it is that looks are like 90 percent objective and then the last 10 percent is uh subjective so like whenever I've, I've been asked that question in the past like that's the response i've i've been given so like you know some people are going to be like so it's at a degree plus or minus one so if you're a six out of ten some women are going to rate you as a seven some room some women are going to rate you as a five like none are going to say oh no you're a two and likewise, none are going to say that you're a nine or a 10. Like you're only going to have like plus or one minus uh, difference. Mm. 
Yeah. Okay. So what I'm probably thinking here then is that potentially once you have achieved a, okay, think this is a little bit complex, but uh, just ask clarifying questions if I lose you at any point here. Imagine a scale between six and 10. So forget all the guys that are five and under, but between six and 10, mm. imagine that's the only scale that we're looking at then. Then I think that that difference between six and seven seems a lot larger. So as long as you meet basic levels of objective attractiveness, once you have met those levels, then subjectivity becomes a lot more important. But if you haven't yet met even those basic modicums of like height, you know, being in good shape, you know, symmetrical face or whatever, if you're five or under, then the objectivity is way, way more prevalent. So the more good looking you are in the scale, the more subjective preferences matter. Did, did you follow that? Yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll agree with that. Yeah. So obviously, like if you're, you know, so if you're sub five, it doesn't really matter if you have blue eyes, green eyes or um the black eyes is because it's such a minor difference yeah. because if your face is hideous and it's really unsymmetrical you've got a really weak and recessed jaw like having blue eyes isn't going to make a difference but once you reach the upper echelons of the look scale so if you're like a seven or an eight then like some girls are going to place a lot more high value on somebody having blue eyes as opposed to green eyes because they have a like a niche preference for that that's when the subjectivity comes in oh man I'm so glad I was like, God, am I going to be able to explain this? And am I making any sense? I'm so glad you understood what I was saying there. But to be honest, uh, we, that actually sounds like we're kind of in agreement because that's, that's sort of how I think about it is if you don't meet that basic level for objective attractiveness, then that's all that really matters. But if you do, then suddenly there's room for that subjectivity. So we, we might actually be on the same page there. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. It, it, it makes me think about something that I have pondered, which is that you like there's not the right person to go to for dating advice for everybody because personally I would find it difficult. And I actually interviewed um, a dating coach called James Tusk, who's a really good looking guy. And I put this to him. I said, why would anybody listen to you for advice on women? Because you're so good looking, you know, he's a really tall, well-built kind of guy. I was like, any guy who's uglier than you, in my opinion, can't really learn from you. If I was a guy who was looking to get advice on how to get a girlfriend, I would almost insist that he was worse looking than me as proof that what he was teaching me was going to work. And so it makes me think that not everybody in this world is going to find the advice that I give on my channel, although mine's a little bit less advice and more just explaining psychology, but you, you get my basic point is that not everybody's going to find my stuff useful because unless they're at my level of attractiveness, then our worldviews and our experiences are not really going to um, mash up and be actually that relevant. For guys who are kind of around the same level of attractiveness as me or perhaps more attractive, they'll find tremendous use in what I'm saying because it starts from that as the baseline. But if you're uglier than me, you kind of need to, to speak to somebody else who can get from that experience and speak to that. And I think it's quite good that there is like advice can be stratified in that way. What do you think about that? Hmm. Yeah, I think that's a really good argument that you've made. And I actually watched the um, full interview that you did with uh, James Tuss. So I know what you're talking about. And in fact, I actually made a like a segment in one of my videos about James Tusk and I highlighted how he's really attractive and like his he, his uh, like sort of goal is about teaching men game and like the right things to say, how to pick up women. But I highlighted in some of his interactions that his game meant nothing in each of those. And in fact, some of his jokes were like flat out just bad. Like they weren't funny, but the girls still uh, responded in positive light uh, because they were attracted to his looks. And there's actually su subtle signs that you can um, see from women that they give off that show they're attracted to you. So I highlighted in one of his interactions that a woman like uh, repeatedly brushed her hair. Um, like she smiled really enthusiastically. Like she was laughing at all of her, all of his jokes, like that couldn't have even been like further from funny. Um, like, and she was still giving all of those signs showing that she was attracted to him. And um, like, it, I, and I kind of highlighted in that video that his game really wasn't relevant. So, I, I put it slightly different. I, I can totally see where you're coming from, but the way I think of it is that, I mean, I haven't seen the video talking about maybe his game was horrible in that one, but 
no, it's usually it's good. Like, no disrespect to him, but um, occasionally, like you know, any man who's trying to talk to women, like sometimes you're going to be off the off the ball. Like, you're not going to be on the mark. Like, you don't have the good winning lines. Like, you're not as confident as you usually are. But usually, his game is good. Yeah, well, he, he's good looking enough to get away with some bad game every now and yeah, then. Yeah, that's that's what I mean. That's what I was trying to highlight in the video. Yeah. So I get that. I think the reason why a lot of guys who who you might think of as like as good looking, the reason why they don't um, resonate with the black pill like looks kind of content is because they might have been hopeless with women before they learned game because that was like my experience. I won't say I was like hopeless, but it was when I was learning this pickup artist stuff and I started practicing social skills back when I was like, you know, like almost 15 years ago now, <laughs> it makes me feel old. Um, but like, I saw such a dramatic shift in my ability to attract women into my life. And I mean, like, like night and day and nothing really changed about my appearance, but my dating life, you know, changed so much in the course of six months. And so you, you felt that power of, oh, okay. It's not my looks. There was something about the way I was interacting with women that was making that difference. And I think that you have a difficult time selling the black pill perspective to any guy who has personally felt the difference that going to the gym, working on your game, self-improvement, going to therapy. When you, when you've had guys had that personal experience and you're trying to tell them the, the look stuff, I don't think you're going to, you're going to find any positive recruits there. And it's one of the reasons why I don't necessarily, you know, get on board with it. But what I'm thinking more and more is that potentially like if I'm an average looking guy or above average, if my ego can allow me to get there a little bit, I think that I'm having that different experience because perhaps when you are good looking enough, then the difference between a good dating life and a bad dating life is potentially going to be based on your game. But if you are below average looking, then no amount of game in the world potentially is going to help you or you need to have supremely awesome games. So it's almost like there's a set of rules that are applicable to one group of guys based on their genetics and it, it actually doesn't work for another group of guys. Is that how you see it? Yeah, so I actually like covered this in a one of my early videos of mine. Um, so as far as my understanding goes, there are three tiers of men. So you have like the sub fives who are just, God save them, like really unattractive. And then you have like the normie tier. So anyone who's like average looking to like slightly above average. And then you have chads. So like the really attractive people. And in one of my videos, I actually highlighted that if you are in that middle tier, if you're in the middle ground, if you're an average looking guy, then game and going to the gym, confidence, like they can help you help push you over that threshold um, and be able to make changes to your dating life. So like they, they can actually be a good help to you. However, if you're in one of the other two categories, then like the things that you're talking about, like your game confidence, going to the gym, they aren't really going to mean much difference. Firstly, if you're a Chad, like if you're really good looking, then your game isn't going to make a difference because like you've kind of already won with women anyway, like your looks is enough to push you over that threshold. And as highlighted in several of my videos, like if you're good looking enough, women do not care how bad or horrible your game is like you can have the worst jokes like you can i've even shown one example where a man flat out insults a woman um in a tinder conversation he says oh um it looks like you're wearing a latex mask and the woman is still um finding that joke uh funny like she's still going through with it and she actually ends up asking him um so are you going to call me then are you going to text me back like she ends up simping over him so if you're good looking enough if you're in that chat category then your game and confidence isn't going to really, really mean much of a difference because your looks already passes you over the threshold likewise if you're on the other end of the spectrum if you're a sub five then game is also isn't going to make a difference because the battle's already been lost as soon as you've walked in the room like you the way i put it is that a lot of dating is like two separate filters so the first filter is like in the first two seconds is the like mostly the looks filter so everything you can gain from a person about their first impressions and then the second filter is like your you know the long-term sort of information so that's where your status your game and your confidence comes into play and if you're constantly getting filtered out at filter one which sub fives will do then there's no way for them to progress into the second stage where they can showcase their superior personality their game whatever but if you're in that normie tier then you know, like you have a okay chance of 
passing filter one and that and that's when um your other stuff can come into play yep okay so then i'm guessing that our point of difference on this one is going to be that um and just correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm guessing that you probably think that maybe like as high as 30 or 40% of men are like irredeemably like ugly in the eyes of women. And it's kind of over for them. Mm. And whereas I would probably put that number smaller. I don't deny their existence necessarily, though. I still think even for them, there's something that's got to be done. You know, <laughs> like I don't think anybody's totally beyond the pale. Maybe I do. I don't know. That's just a hard thing to kind of pass judgment on. Like, you know, you don't want to sort of say that, but I would say that the majority of men would be in that category of their looks are not so bad that it disqualifies their ability to get a girlfriend provided they start working on other things. Whereas I'm guessing you would probably think that maybe the two groups of like the mid tier and the lower tier would be like around about equal. Would that be accurate? Um, no. So I do think that there is like two separate tiers. So if you're in that mid tier, then like, it goes to the point that you was bringing up earlier that there is different advice that you would give to mm -hmm. different people in different situations. So if you are in the uh, sub five range, going to these pickup artists that we spoke about earlier is only just going to, it's just going to be fruitless because you're going to be wasting all of this money learning skills that you don't need because you're constantly getting filtered out at the look stage and women aren't going to date you solely because of that. It doesn't matter how much um, things you learn in these uh, programs. Meanwhile, if you are in the, like mid sort of tier, um, you know, the normie range such as yourself. And you actually found out yourself that learning game and doing these, um, you know, pick up things, they, they actually did prove to be a benefit to you. Yep. So if you had to give an arbitrary kind of number <laughs> and, and feel free to say no, if you don't want to, but what percentage would you say of men are uh, in the lower tier? I think I actually worked it out one time, but um, so I, I think it's about 15% of men are five foot six or below. It might be five foot seven. And like already then, like if you're five foot seven, then I think it's 83% of women are automatically going to reject you because of height and nothing else. I'll bring up, in fact, uh, I've got the uh, correct data here. So I'll bring it up so I'm not getting it wrong. So if you're... If you're no, sir, five foot. Yeah, if you're five foot four, then ninety percent of women will reject you immediately. So like, I'm a metric of, man of height. I'm a metric man. Sorry, what is five foot four in centimeters? Um, it's roughly about one hundred and sixty something. It'll be. Yeah, right. I mean, the height pill is absolutely brutal. Yeah. Not just in so it's one hundred and sixty-two centimeters. God, and so just under 162 and 83% of women say no, no, no. no so chance. not, not, yeah. And that's, and like this study that was done, like that's just the women who said, like that's yeah. not <laughs> even, in, that's not include, that's not even including the ones that um, would be like, oh yeah, of course, yeah. I, I wouldn't mind dating a shorter man as long as he's taller than me. As long Are as he's taller than me. Are you insinuating that sometimes women's words don't match their actions when it comes to dating? That's, of course that's, that's outrageous that's blasphemous yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah um, so like that's the point i'm like trying to make is that um so you've got a certain number a certain percentage of people that are going to be uh short and like it's going to be like ex extraordinarily like difficult for them to attract women like it's not going to be completely finished for them but you know like in basic terms if you put it like in the most black and white terms then it's going to like that's that's going to be the most important factor of like their rejection so you're going to have a certain number of people that are short then you're going to have a certain number of people that are going to be um unattractive you're going to have another certain number of people that like lack inches if, if you know what i mean you're going to have a certain number of people that are um like going to be balding like you're going to have a certain number of people like you know that, that are all going to be these different things and it's they all add up to different factors do you get frustrated when you hear people deny the importance of looks when it comes to attraction and dating? I, re I very rarely um, hear people deny the importance of looks. But like, uh, like dating coaches and, and, and things like that, like what I get a sense of, and um, I'm just asking you, cause I don't think you uh, want to take on the mantle for your entire community and like sort of speak for the Blackpool movement as a whole. But it seems to me that there's, 
an undercurrent of annoyance and frustration, almost at the invalidation of their experience, you know, because they sense very strongly inside themselves that the reason that they're not being successful is genetic and they're just not attractive enough to really get a girlfriend and to constantly be told, no, no, it's this, you're not, you know, going to the gym or you're not, um, you know, learning your game or you're not doing this or, or that, these things within your control. That's the real reason. And they're kind of pissed off or just crying out for somebody to actually be like, no, like your lived experience is real. What you think it is, is actually what you, what you think it is. And so, I'm, uh, yeah, what, what do you think? So like, I think it, it comes into, into play when, like you've lived lived two different worlds. So like from my perspective, I used to be like really unattractive. Like so pre puberty, like I had I had good uh, puberty like development, so I was actually able to reach that average tier of looks. But before puberty, like when I was about sixteen or seventeen, um, like I was grossly unattractive. Like I was easily about a three um, in looks, I would say. And I at that at this point in my life, like I was still learning all of the pickup techniques. I was still watching all of these channels, uh, teaching game, like, and I was trying to implement all of these things, and nothing ever worked. Like, I didn't have one success like in that period of time, but it was only after puberty, and I was I was more attractive, and then I started seeing changes in my results. And perhaps the like most black pilling black pilling moment of all was um, when I had my first relationship. Um, the girl that I was dating at that time I showed her a picture of what I looked like a few a few years ago and I remember her words so um clearly I showed her that picture and she said wait if you look like that now then I wouldn't have gone near you it must have and hearing that was hearing that was just heartbreaking like I, I couldn't believe it I was like what are you serious like it it was a joke um and and like that's when it was like kind of clear to me that like it was mostly my looks um like being the main determiner and then obviously all the things that i had on top were just uh bonuses in that respect i want to talk about that but just 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 quickly what what age did you go through puberty no oh, so like obviously you go through puberty for about like from like 13 to um uh, right. like 15 16 but like your face isn't fully developed like you're still going to be like developing your facial structure all throughout your like mid to high teens. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> no, no worries. So, okay. Let's talk about the, your, your relationship there because you spoke about the two filters that you kind of have to pass through with regards to a woman. Like that's that first attraction filter. Like, Oh, is this guy good looking enough for me to give him the time of day? And then after that, she's going to be more interested in your social connections, your status, your wealth, you know, personality and all that sort of stuff. It seems to me that, the black pill or focusing on looks, it can't exist as a full ideology with regards to dating relationships and female psychology. I don't think that um, there's any like advice on actually how to conduct yourself inside a relationship, how to, you know, maintain positive uh, connections with people, how to communicate boundaries, um, you know, to set couple goals, any of that, because it's all just based on, well, how do I get her to swipe right, you know, on me in Tinder. And so in that sense, I don't really think of it in terms of, oh, okay, discussing looks and appearances is the be all and end all, which is why like on my channel, I feel like I've, I've covered studies. Um, I did one on like speed dating, one on like um, like hypothetical situations with an ugly guy and a, a good looking guy. Like I talk about looks on my channel, but I can't just talk about looks because once you're in a relationship, being hot is not gonna maintain that relationship for you. If you're a jerk or if you're insecure or you're a loser or whatever, you're not going to be able to keep the girl, you know, you might be able to sleep with her, but actually maintaining a relationship and understanding a woman is so much more complex than that. So I feel like that's potentially a point of difference between us, but I'm, I want to check with you because to me, maybe the looks kind of stuff is a small part of that pie. It's just a way to get the door opened, you know, if say 5%, but it's really not very interesting. There's not that much to talk about. There's, there's this huge spectrum of more interesting things to discuss after that, that's going to be relevant to you leading a happy life. Whereas I get the sense, and correct me if I'm wrong, that the black pill kind of guys, they sort of feel, it seems to me from the limited exposure I've had, that dating and relationships sort of begins and ends based on how attractive you are. And if you're a hot guy, you're a Chad, th that's it. It's a honeymoon, you know, fairy tale ending forever. Well, I have um, like two points of disagreement on that. So the first one, like how many times do you see online uh, women posting about like their jerk boyfriend 
and like how much of an asshole he is like and like he's he's yeah just really horrible to them like so you still see these women like staying with abusive partners so like how often do you see that and a lot of the time like those red flags of them like having a bad personality were shown in the early stages but a lot of the time these women will ignore those red flags because they want to be in a relationship with this high quality man yeah okay so this is definitely a point of disagreement let's explore this a little bit further how much do you know about the psychology of abuse of like victims and perpetrators and um like childhood origins and things like that so not like a huge amount but like i was just highlighting the point it's not like a deep one obviously like abuse is a quite a touchy subject but um i was just highlighting that you do see it online um you know posts onto forums websites facebook about women like you know pretty much slagging off their boyfriend um saying that he's a jerk to them like that he's not horrible he's not nice like he's being horrible to them at the moment and the they still kind of like maintain those partners but um would i be correct in saying that in your teachings in your channel that those men would be doing the opposite of the right things to do um in terms of like maintaining a partner um well, what are they doing so like they're doing the so they're not following your like sort of advice in, in the respect that of, so like what advice would you give to somebody in terms of like maintaining a relationship and how to keep a partner? I've got like 400 videos worth of advice on that. Yeah. One. yeah. I'm not sure I can, so I if, can... if you had to like sum it up as quickly as you can, like, what would you say? Work on yourself so that you don't play out your own insecurities on your relationship. Avoid any kind of codependence so that you don't make your partner responsible for your emotions. Don't tolerate disrespect from your partner. Insist that she's doing her own self-growth and that she's supportive of you. Maintain like a masculine frame, uh, lead the relationship, attend to her needs, attend to your own needs and to enjoy your partner. You know, that's your, fundamentally your most important task is to make sure that you're actually having fun and getting like pleasure out of her, out of her um, existence and being like a, near you because that's you taking care of your needs. You know, you need to be responsible for your own happiness and that. And if she's not making you happy, that's kind of on you. You need to either make a shift inside yourself or with her. Um, <laughs> I, I don't like giving a, a yeah. basic summary because I could think of a million more things if you gave me a few hours. So going on that last point, um, like would these, you know, jerk partners that women go into a relationship with, are, are they following that? Like, are they making their relationship enjoyable and fun and happy? Uh, if they're abusive, no. But then do these women still stay with those partners? Oh, yeah, but they do. But um, I, And to correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that the point that you are going to try to make was that uh, because these guys are good looking, that's the reason why these women are staying. Is that correct? I was going to make the point, yeah, that they're like high value men, that that's the reason that they, they are willing to stay stay with them. Okay, so high quality is definitely subjective. So it's possible that those women perceive him to be subjective, uh, subjectively high quality because maybe he's um, rich and powerful. Maybe he's got a lot of friends or business connections or social connections, bit of fame, bit of money. Maybe he's really good looking or whatever. But uh, I'm guessing you and I, we wouldn't necessarily call somebody who was abusing their partner high quality. Like he's obviously a dickhead. Like I put him as like the lowest, lowest quality. Only total trash men like abuse their female partners. Hmm. So, I mean, from my perspective, and, and again, there's no objective rule for that, but they're absolutely low quality men. Um, the very fact that they're abusing their partners precludes them from entering into that stratosphere. Yeah. So, um, sorry. Yeah. I've got another point to make, but do you want to, do you have something to say? Yeah. Yeah. So the other point that I was going to bring up was that, so why do men end up like going into relationships and their like marriage ends up becoming a dead bedroom? uh wow well, okay so can can you hold on to that one because i'll just finish up the point about the other uh point there because i think that's a slightly different topic so i just want to make the point that the reason that if from my perspective and my understanding of the world is that the reason the majority of women stay with abusive partners doesn't have to do primarily with the fact that their boyfriend is good looking it might be why they started off with a person and it might play somewhat of a role 
probably not in all women, but in really trashy, superficial women who really care about like appearances and people, you know, seeing like a facade of like a good relationship with a high quality guy, you know, a woman who's that shallow, it might pay a lot of attention to her, but the psychology of an abuse victim is a lot more complex than something, you know, as superficial and shallow as that it has roots in childhood as to the kind of role model she had from like her father or even her mother, what she internalized love is with regards to self-sacrifice and codependence the degree to which her own self-esteem can adequately set boundaries and emotionally like communicate what she's feeling in a way that's actually righteous and, you know, conveys her sort of self-esteem. And so women who stay in abusive relationships, they're almost like, um, like they've been tortured in such a way that their own ability to do what's right for them has been disrupted. You know, they've been psychologically damaged and psychically like uh, interrupted so that they place the needs of their partner and like, avoiding him being like you know, upset and avoiding the fear that comes from his outbursts as more important than her own safety. So you're talking about a woman whose mind is essentially muddled up, you know, cause she's lost in that abuse. When you start going into that kind of depth, like if you, you look into the therapy of like however many years it would take for an abuse victim to actually confront all the psychological reasons why she stayed in an abusive relationship, I think you'd find the fact that he was hot would be negligible. You know, maybe 20 minutes in one therapy session was, was spent talking about that. When you actually look at the vast majority of other experiences and childhood, like, um, you know, things that she's been through that play into that decision, if you can even call it a decision, that's going to be hugely outweighed. So th that's my perspective on it. And um, we can agree to disagree, or you can tell me what you think of that, but um yeah, that, that's all the point I want to make on that last topic. Yeah, that's actually a really good point that you've just raised there. Um, maybe I don't know as much as I thought I did, and um, maybe I will have to give it a few more years and try research a bit more into that sort of topic about abusive relationships. But I think that you did have a well-articulated point there. It's just complex, and it's it's sad. What frustrates me is when I do see women totally deny the importance of looks like that. That really gets to me because if you ask women, what do you look for in a man? They never talk about it. They, they never talk about it. I did this video, um, the nine qualities that women never admit that they want in men. And I put number one was looks, but they don't talk about it. And there was another piece of data. I don't know if you saw this one, Wheat, but I found it so interesting. It was speed dating data. And they asked women to predict, no, they asked women, what do you look for in a partner? And what's most likely to get you on a date? And they all said the number one thing was intelligence. You know, looks was, you know, sort of middle of the road. And then after the speed dating event, they correlated with what they thought was important with what actually translated into second dates. And by far and away, the best predictor by a huge amount was how attractive the man was. And it just strikes me, and I've made so many videos on this, I can't stand the, the hypocrisy of women criticizing men for being shallow, for being all about looks. When women are just as bad, maybe not just as bad, but they're really bad in that regard as well. It's just that women don't admit it. Or I've often wondered if they just don't even have the self like awareness of it. Like, do you think women are consciously denying and lying how much like looks matter to them? Or do you think that they honestly don't even know themselves how big of a factor it is? No, I think that they do know to themselves like, how big of a factor it is, but they deliberately try to um, delude men into thinking that it's not important as a means of making themselves look good and like virtue signaling to make themselves look a noble, make themselves look noble and virtuous in saying that uh, looks don't matter and they do care about personality more. Yeah. It, it's probably you're going to get find some women for some and other women do it for the other motivation. But I think that amongst girls, like when girls are just talking amongst themselves, they're going to be way more likely to be honest. You know what I mean? Like, oh, he's so hot. He's so dreamy. Yeah, 100%. Whatever. But when they're talking with men, it's almost like this, this collective agreement they've all made. Never talk about it. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the study that you brought up like, was actually quite interesting because they the, did the same one against with men. And the men actually said that, they, they were honest. They said that looks were important. Like they, they'd said, oh yeah, of course, like we need to be attracted to a woman, um, like for us to be willing to date her. But the, it was just crazy that the uh, dichotomy there was that women were virtue signaling instead and they underplayed the importance of looks. Yeah. And also I want to go back to a point that you raised like about a minute ago. You said that women care less about looks than men, or you said like 
just as bad as men. But then you said, um, oh, they're not as bad as men. Like they, they're a little bit nicer. Like they don't care about as looks as men. Um, I have to disagree with that point. I would say women actually uh, hold looks higher to a higher degree than men do. Okay. So that, that'll be a difficult one because I've, I've done like, like I've read through scientific studies that didn't come to that conclusion, but maybe there's studies that you're aware of. I'm not. Well, I, th- I think it goes from more of an observable uh, reality, like sort of basis. So like if you have these studies at hand, um, then you're welcome to show me them and I'll take a look through them. Yeah. So um, like I'll... straight away, because obviously like studies are going to be more relevant than personal anecdotes. But um, so if you have the studies at hand, then go ahead um, and show me them. But I, can I do have like the... a, cu- a couple of personal anecdotes to provide. Well, let, let's hear them in a moment, but um, anybody who's listening to this and you can as well, if you look onto my channel and go proof that women will never change, there's a video like that. And this was the largest like sociological study on this topic ever done because they've got women from like a hundred plus different countries. And so the data like size, the, the sample size was just massive. And so Muslim countries, conservative countries, progressive countries, everybody, and they have these kind of bell curves plotted with regards to appearance and to how much weighting it is, as well as a couple of other factors. And it's just a much thicker bulge towards appearance for men as to what they're looking for than it is for women. So that's the study that first came to mind. Okay. Well, a study that I have, well, I'll I'll bring up the height one again. Mm -hmm. So if you bring up the height graph of like how um, much women are going to be willing to date men based on their height, then you will see that it's like 90% rejection rate if you're five for four or below. And at five for eight, it's 50%. Like you're never going to see that with um, men. Like men, men don't really care about height anywhere near as much as women. Yeah, that's totally true. Yeah. And so you would put height as part of looks and appearance, which I guess you should, right? Yeah. Yeah. No, that makes sense. Now the height pill is brutal. I've had people ask me, what advice do you have for short guys? And I mean, I mean, look at me, I'm a YouTube guy who's claiming to have answers on this kind of stuff. And it's like, fuck, I don't, I don't know if there's a magic bullet that's actually going to solve that. As far as I can tell, all of my advice is going to be relevant to you, but I don't know if it's specifically going to overcome that particular disadvantage because it's brutal. Women are so, so highly, highly attuned to height. So, I mean, I guess maybe you have some answers that you could tell me that I can then pass on to people. If like a really short guy comes to you and says, yo, I'm, I'm short. Women don't pay attention to me. Like what do you just validate to him? Like, about, yeah, it's really rough. Or do you have well, some kind of actionable advice that you can give him? Well, I have three pieces of advice that I can give to any short guy. So okay. the first is the soft approach. So you can divide looks maxing into two types. There's soft looks maxing and then there's hard looks maxing. Soft looks maxing is anything that's like under a hundred dollars. Like it's cheap. It's easy. You can do it tomorrow. Like it's not difficult. So if you take if you're a short guy and you take a soft approach to something that will be anything such as like putting lifts in your shoes or wearing shoes with which give you an extra like couple of inches worth of height like that's that's what i would do in terms of that respect in terms of a hard approach to improving your height then there are options available such as leg lengthening surgery and that can increase your height by anywhere from like two to three inches um and so like if you take it if you go back to the graph that i showed earlier if you're five foot six, then you're going to have a 75% rejection rate. If you increase your height by three inches, so you go up to five foot nine, then only 33% of women are automatically going to reject you based on height. I have to ask, is there any data on the rejection rate for women who become aware that the man has had leg lengthening surgery? Um, I can see where you're coming from on that point, because obviously if somebody gets leg lengthening surgery, then they're going to, their body proportions are going to be look a little bit off because their legs are going to be considerably longer than their torso. It's just not going to look right. But um, I wasn't, that's true. Sorry to jump in, but I wasn't even thinking of that. I was thinking was that about what you the were saying? intense insecurity that obviously <laughs> is inside that man to the lengths that he's going to go and get like, uh, like surgery, something massive that you're doing to your body to overcome that. Like if I was, 
like like straight up i understand not every guy is like this but if i was interested in a girl and then she told me that she had got plastic surgery it would instantly disqualify her from my perspective no matter how hot she is because i'm like oh this is not somebody who has a mindset that i can respect she cares way too much about appearances she's so fragile with her ego that she's gonna go under the knife <laughs> just to cosmetically alter mm -hmm. herself in a really like massive way and i have to imagine that there's got to be at least some percentage of women out there who are the same with me they just wouldn't date a man who is insecure enough to get surgery well so if you put that to a side and you look to a purely mathematical standpoint and the example that i gave was that if you're a man who's five foot six and you gain three inches of height then your rejection to acceptance rate goes from 75% to 33%. Like that is highly significant. Like that's massive. That's pretty much doubling your pool of options. More than doubling, actually. I mean, it's a devastating statistic and I totally hear you. I just don't think that it's applicable because what you're comparing there is natural height to natural height, not natural height to artificially surgically enhanced height. You know what I mean? Yeah, I know what you're saying. Um, so obviously but, your body proportions will look a little bit different. Um, but provided everything stays the same, then that is the result you get. So maybe it will go from 75% to 40% instead, maybe not 33%. But there yeah, still will... We, like, it's we a need data on it, but I, I, I get the point that you're making, yeah. Yeah. Um, so and, you were saying uh, three points of advice. You've got the soft looks maxing, maxing. Was that the medium one, the the surgery one? No, so soft, soft looks maxing would be um, like wearing shoes um, with extra height. Hard looks maxing will be getting surgery to increase your height. And then the third um, piece of advice that I could give is like geo maxing. So that is um, putting yourself in a location where men are of shorter height. So that's like kind of making you appear taller than you actually are. So a lot of people think that men are the same height everywhere, but that's simply not true because in the West, the average height is five foot 10. So for Caucasian men living in the UK, US, Australia, the average height for them is five foot 10. But if you go to countries such as like Thailand or um, Bangladesh or Taiwan, places like that, then the average height is I think it's five foot five or five foot six, depending on where you go. In Taiwan and Bangladesh, did you say? Yeah. Yeah, right. Okay, so <laughs> my mind went to the Mbuti forest, like in the Congo, like the, the pygmy people. <laughs> You'd be a giant there. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> okay, so, but then what about all the other stuff that like pickup artists and dating coaches would talk about, like developing social circle, making money, learning games, stuff like that. You wouldn't mm. give that advice. Well, because at the end of the day, the, their highest cause of rejection, like the main reason they're getting rejected, rejected is because of their height. Like women will just flat out say, Oh, you're too short for me. And remember how you said earlier that women are like, won't ever dare speak about looks. They're never going to tell a man that he's too unattractive for them. I think height is the one caveat where they actually will tell a man that um, he's too short for them. They'll just I'll say, oh no, uh, I only date men who are at least taller than me uh, or at least like a few inches taller than me. Or even you see it on people's Tinder bios, like yeah. you see women posting their Tinder bios all the time, uh, six foot plus only. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I don't know how tall you are. I am i don't know what feet is. I'm 174. Four, I think I used to tell people I was 175, but then I was chatting to a guy who yeah. seemed taller than me and he said he was 175. So I just knocked it down a centimeter. How tall are you? Um, I'm 178. So 5'10". I think 174 is five foot eight and a little bit. Okay. So I'm below average in height and you're like exactly average, at least in the West, but you'd be tall mm. if you went to Taiwan, like you were saying. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Fair enough. So what is, what is the like the long term kind of strategy, I guess, for your channel or the Black Pill movement on the whole? Like, do you are you trying to get everybody to move to Asia? Or I mean, it's, I don't want to give silly suggestions, <laughs> but what, like, what's the the end goal? What's the intention? Well, so like, I think there's three things attached to the Black Pill ideology. There's like, so have you ever heard of the pillar analogy before? No. So like, people use it um, with lots of different things. So they will say, "Oh, here are three pillars for why." Uh, this regime was a dictatorship have you ever heard of that before like that sort of thing no 
Oh, so like the way the analogy goes is like if you break down any one of those pillars, then it would have been impossible. Okay. Yeah. That so makes like obviously, sense. like you need you need all pillars to hold up the um, like to support the system, basically. Mm-hmm. So yeah. like I think there's three pillars for the ideo- ideology of the black pill. The first pillar is like realizing the importance of looks. So you realize that um, women aren't truthful when they say what's the most attractive thing that um, looks is actually the most the biggest uh, predictor of your chance of getting a relationship with a girl. So it's the most important factor. And any like sort of quick YouTube search of doing a Tinder study of like having an attractive guy with an unattractive guy will prove that. Like it, it doesn't really take that much effort to realize that sort of aspect. And the second pillar is inflexibility. So there isn't really much you can change about your looks. So six of the seven most important factors to do with your looks are uh, genetic. So your height. Um, your attractiveness in your face, so your facial bones. Um, if you're bald, like that's mostly to do with your genetics. Uh, your weight is something that you can change, so um, like that's the only sort of behavioural factor that like is more important, and that carries a lot of weight. Um, how many inches you have, which again I don't need to explain. Uh, how your age and your ethnicity. So those six out of those seven things are mostly to do with your genetic at least 90 to 95 percent genetic those those factors um and then the last uh pillar so that was inflexibility so there's not really much you can do to change your looks and the last pillar to the last pillar is uni- unanimity so um women are in agreement for the things that they find attractive so like you can pretty much draw on a piece of paper like um the things that women find attractive so they will want a man who has a good jawline, hunter eyes, full head of hair, six foot plus tall, um, like good aesthetic body. So like you can pretty much pencil down the things that make men attractive and women are in agreement of these factors. So there's not a pool of women that say, oh yeah, I like, I like guys who are five foot four. Like, and then other pools of women are saying, oh yeah, I like guys who are six foot plus. Like you don't get that. Most, like, I think most men can agree that women are chasing the same men like there's high value men and there's low value men yep um so i i I, is there (laughs) i suppose that's a diagnosis of like the the problem i'm more curious about the strategy moving forward for like a solution or is is there none well like so if you take a look at those three pillars Mm -hmm. um the reason it's a pillar analogy is because if you break any one of those things down, then there wouldn't be an issue because if looks weren't important, then it wouldn't matter um, if there's not really much that you can do to change your looks. It wouldn't matter if women are in agreement of the things they find attractive because it doesn't matter. Um, like you can just persuade women to attract you based on your personality. Likewise, if the inflexibility thing was an issue, uh, if that didn't exist and the other two pillars were still there, then it wouldn't matter that looks matter. It wouldn't matter that women are agreement because you could just change your looks. You could improve, um, you could become the person that women find attractive. And lastly, if women aren't in agreement of um, who they find attractive, um, then it would be simple because you just need to find the specific girl that finds your look attractive. It wouldn't matter um, if women care about looks and there's nothing you can do to change your looks because you just need to find a certain woman who finds your specific look attractive. So if you break any one of those pillars down, then like there wouldn't be an issue. So uh, sorry if I'm slow to the uptake then. I, are you saying that it is the goal of the black pill movement to try and break one of those pillars? Um, not necessarily because those pillars are like pretty much here to stay. Like nothing's really going to change, but you've got to find ways to like move around those pillars. If you know what I mean? I don't. <laughs> I think it's, <laughs> okay. it's, it's one of the things that I think like for people within the kind of um, sphere of like ideology that you're in, some of this stuff probably just seems like common sense. And so hopefully speaking to me, you'll get a sense of what someone who's not like in all that kind of area the problems they have in turn, trying to totally kind of understand where you're coming from. So treat my questions and my ignorance and my slowness in getting this stuff as the kind of questions you might get quite a lot. If you know, you're more successful and you become, you know, big on YouTube, you might get this because 
what it, it just seems very, very much like a like diagnosis oriented, not solution oriented. And you can rag on PUAs and dating, dating coaches. And like, I, I quite enjoy that. You and I could probably have a good time doing that. I don't really like to do too negative kind of content, but you could make the case that at the very least they're solution oriented. They're trying to make it work in some sort of perspective. Mm. So like, it, it can't be a surprise to you that, you know, there's a lot of misogyny around the, the looks based movement. There's a lot of hating on, on women. And that turns off a lot of guys, like a lot of guys, I feel like might totally understand the, oh yeah, women are superficial, just like men are, you know, they are the reason I'm not successful with women is because of my looks. Like they totally get that part, but then it seems difficult sometimes to separate that discussion from the plus the reason that women won't date me is because they're all bitches. And, you know, we need to, to have women like distributed to men or, or whatever nonsense. And it's like, okay, well, is there, like a positive side to the black pill. It's like, no, 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 this, this is a solution. This is not a doom and gloom kind of perspective. We're not about hating women. This is just about education. You know, we kind of go there because, you know, without tuning my own horn, that's kind of what I feel like I'm trying to do. It's obviously not perfect because it's really difficult, but I'm trying to, on the one hand, totally validate men's concerns. Like, yes, the look stuff, totally real. The height stuff, totally real. But look, here's the best chance that you've got is to understand women, to improve yourself, you know, to do all this kind of stuff. You know, it's always trying to work towards a solution and get people into happy kind of relationships. What do you think is your version of that or the black pill kind of version of that? Or are you not interested in providing solutions? Like, is it no? First, we need widespread acknowledgement of the diagnosis and then other people will figure out the solutions. Well, it goes back to the point that we were talking about earlier, that there's different solutions based on where you stand in your looks so, and you kind of like you, first you need the diagnosis so like you need to figure out what is the main cause of your rejection so is it your height is it your face like what specifically about your face is it your jawline like is there a problem with your maxilla like um your eyes something like that or are you balding um so you first need like the diagnosis and then from there you can kind of work out the uh solution so say so here's the most like plain and simple obvious example i can give so say if a man he was successful with dating um like in his 20s and then in his late 20s in his early 30s he went bald like literally completely in the blink of an eye he went bald then the most simple solution that you can think of is um gay hair transplant so if if he suddenly went bald and then his results plummeted they sunk like a rock after he went bald and provided there was no mindset changes like he was still doing the exact same things that he was doing uh, before in terms of his approach then like clearly the diagnosis is there that his lack of hair his loss of hair was uh, the cause of his rejection so getting a hair transplant that will reinstill um his his chance of uh, success yeah it's I, I totally get where you're coming from there yeah. it's, it's just, the most I, black and white example i can give but um but no, that's I, I get sort that of like the idea nuance the specific person's individual circumstances i just kind of bring it back to that like like the idea of a hair transplant to me just seems totally ridiculous, but I'm not necessarily in the position of being as lonely and rejected as some guy. And he feels like it's his baldness. So I don't want to necessarily kind of judge, but I just feel like there would be a sizable number of women out there who, when they find out that a guy was so insecure about his hairline that he got like plugs, like someone else's hair put into his scalp. I actually don't even know, understand how it works but they'd be like, Oh no, that's actually the thing that turns me off. You've got a great hairline, but you know, psychologically, you're not the kind of guy who I want to be with. Um, I partially disagree with that because like when you look at, when men look at women, um, do they uh, see it as a bad thing if they try to correct their flaws? So like say if a woman wears makeup and she specifically like puts foundation over a, like a crater on her face, like to try to cover it. Like, do men see that as an insecurity on her part? Like, well, are they likely to judge her and think, oh, um, why are you doing this? Like, you should just own yourself. Like, you should own your flaws and be psychologically, um, like, whatever. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know what I'm trying to say. No, 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 no. It's a really good point. Thank you for bringing it up because I'd love to speak to that because it's one of those areas where I differ from a lot of men. And so I actually don't totally understand how men think in this regard, because for my own individual preferences, the answer is yes. Like, um, I, like when I see women with heavily caked on makeup, 
it's unattractive. When I see women with artificially straightened hair, it's unattractive. When I see women who have dyed their hair and there's no variation in their hair color at all, I don't like that. Like, I'm like, oh, she looks like an artificial Barbie. Like, give to me a woman who looks like she could be barefoot in a forest, like a total fairy, natural, you know, even if she's more plain looking, there's something that makes me feel safe around a woman like that. Probably because I don't care so much about my own appearance. I don't want a woman who's really high maintenance about her appearance because maybe it would just sort of stress me out. And I'm consistently shocked that more men don't see it the same way that I do. Men seem to have a massive tolerance for women wearing ridiculous clothes, getting breast implants, having heaps of makeup, artificial hair, you know, heaps of like earrings and piercings and, and, and whatever like that, that to me are a massive turnoff. But I guess it also speaks then in my perspective to how subjective beauty is because what I find attractive is so different to what I know other men find attractive. So I completely take your point that there may be women who are totally fine with hair transplants or leg extensions or whatever it is, but I'm guessing that they're also women who care heavily about appearance themselves. Where I live and like my social circle, it's kind of like new age hippie-ish kind of vibe. I live in like a surfer town with like wineries and stuff like that. It's very, very laid back. You know, the people here, they don't dress like like it's an inner city cosmopolitan kind of event, you know, that would seem so out of place where I lived. And so if someone was to come along with that kind of like intense, like appearance kind of focus, it would seem really, really out of place. And I don't think people would be resonating with it, but that's just a matter of context. Because if you take that same person and you put them in downtown Sydney, they wouldn't seem out of place at all. You know, it seemed quite normal. So I guess like I kind of agree with you, but then I kind of think you're also sort of agreeing with me and that I, I agree that there will be women and probably more than I'm aware of that are absolutely fine with men getting hair transplants. But I also think that there are women who would be as turned off by it as I am by a woman who gets plastic surgery. So I think as a whole, like when women get uh, plastic surgery, so like if they do get breast implants, that usually does increase their SMV. Like they end up getting more attention. And they actually did a, um, I remember this study. Um, I forgot the exact like terms of it, but I remember this woman was working in a restaurant and they did two experiments. So the first time was just her as herself and they measured like the amount of tips that she got. And then the second time around when they did, when they did the experiment, uh, she wore like big like padding in, in her bra. Yeah. And her tips like went up by like 50% or something, some ridiculous number uh, purely because like her SMV had increased. Uh, yeah, probably not her relationship market value, but definitely her like one night stand, like let me try and buy your affection kind of value. But it honestly, that doesn't surprise me. It just as you started speaking, I was like, yeah, I know where this is going. But again, oh. I guess <laughs> it, it speaks to that subjectivity because I can't think of anything that grosses me out more than the idea of a woman cutting open her tits, you know, like wanting to be objectified more than that, like appealing to that superficiality. She's giving up so much in terms of her long-term natural beauty, her capacity to breastfeed in the future. Like the things that I value in a woman, like self-esteem, confidence, things like that, it's an instant disqualifier. Any woman who has breast implants, I would never consider her for a girlfriend. And I know I'm not alone. Basically all of my friends, and I guess birds of a feather flock together. So the fact that I have like-minded individuals in my social circle doesn't make this a surprise, but I know lots of men who think exactly the same way that I do, but I'm not denying the validity of the data. That definitely sounds like it could be true because there's a lot of guys that don't care. They're like, oh, big tits. Yeah, here's money. I love you, you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so like I've got, you know, so you could be right that in the study, some men like did see the uh, artificially enhanced breasts and they were turned off by it and they actually gave less uh, tips to that person however as a whole like as the majority whole. of yeah as a whole like the majority of men um do think like do just look at uh, a woman's smv for what it is and if they see like uh superior like biological factors um such as having like larger breasts wider hips and um longer hair more luscious hair like they're they're gonna be turned on more by that and they're more likely to see that as a positive yeah no, I think you're probably right. I think yeah. also I did a video on women with large breasts once to talk about the psychology of it, but there is also that subset of men who, when they see a woman who has got breast implants, it triggers that thing in their brain that goes, ah, here's a woman who wants to be objectified. So it's safer to do so. And they feel 
more comfortable with her because she, in a way, by her choices, has kind of invited that. And I always think that's a really interesting thing. But if it's all right with you, I'd like to ask you more about something I just mentioned in passing before, but I'd love to get you to speak directly onto it. How do you feel about the misogyny that exists in the wider black pill kind of culture? So I think I covered this a couple of times in my videos before. And whenever people have like brought up this argument to me, like it's never really been anything more than just a straw man because like I don't see myself as a misogynist. Like I've never um, called out women as like being um, like bitches or anything like that. Like I've never just slagged them off for the sake of slagging them off. Like it's always been backed up with either like data or like the evidence that you have at hand, like a screenshot from a uh, Tinder message or profile. Like, and then I'm just telling the facts as to what it is so when people do uh, call out the black bull sort of community for misogyny like I, th I think it's usually it's usually just like a defense sort of thing like that um people will call it out just because they know that some minority of the people that do uh, follow the black bull ideology like do have those sort of viewpoints i'm gonna i'm gonna give you my positive and I'm going to give you my negative on that one because I definitely don't want my question to you just then to be in any way interpreted as me saying that I think that you're misogynist. I'll admit I haven't seen enough of your content to make that comment, but I did nothing that you've said to me and I wasn't assuming you at all. And I think it's unfair if people are asking you to account for the behavior or the beliefs of others. And I also think it's unfair for people to exaggerate how much something is in and then straw man like that. So in that sense, I completely agree with you. But if you don't mind me just pushing you a little bit there, I do think that the misogyny within the black pill culture is a significant enough of a phenomenon that the answer that you just gave there is not really adequate because I think that if you're going to use that label with regards to yourself, you, you need to have a more honest assessment. And but that might be unfair of me because to be like, in all honesty, you obviously know the community a lot better than I do because I only know it from the periphery. But from what I've seen, it's, 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 it's bad. It's, it's really bad. And I know that even in my relatively mild, moderate kind of videos, in my comment section, there's a huge amount of like misogyny. And so I, I feel like there's a responsibility as, as a creator to, you know, at least once a month or a couple of times a month in one of my videos to really make that point that this is not what that's about and don't think that it's going to be about trashing women and things like that. Because if I'm speaking in this space, I have to be aware of the greater cultural context of which I'm kind of a part of. And I think that it, like moving forward, this won't be that if you become like a big creator and I don't see any reason why you shouldn't, you know, get there, you're going to be asked this question more and more. And so I think your response probably needs to be better than just a defensive no, that's a straw man. It's not so bad. Anybody with plain eyes can see there's a lot out there and the look space community is probably where the worst of it is. And so like, I, I just I give you the opportunity again, you can disagree with me. I won't be offended at all. If you're like, no, Alex, I don't see it like that. But if you have more to say on that, I think it would be a good time to actually speak. Well, do you personally reject it? Like, do you dislike it? Do you understand where it comes from? Do you think that in some way the focus on looks feeds into that? Like, do you think there's some responsibility? anything that you're comfortable sort of saying, I'd, I'd love to hear your perspective on that. Yeah. So again, like I'll go back to like my original point that like, if somebody is going to call me out for that, like it doesn't really make much sense. Like they should call out the people that are actually being misogynist. Um, like if somebody's going to have a discussion with me, they're having a discussion with me, not like my community or like the people that follow my channel. Like they're not having a dis discussion with them like they're they're talking to me and my viewpoints and the things that i've provided in my videos like my data my evidence like that's who they're discussing so like it, it just is a straw man when people are um you know try to chalk off like the black pill community is just a misogynist because not all uh, men who followed this community are like that yep no i i agree with that and I was thinking more strategically. I hope that I'm not coming across as in any way like attacking you or trying to make you responsible for that. 
I'm more coming from the point of view of I want all of this stuff to enter into the mainstream. Like, and I'd love to talk about, you know, a strategy that you might have moving forward, but I don't like seeing what seems to me to be common sense and reality. Things like women care about men's looks. And it's a huge factor when it comes to dating. I don't like that fact is only being discussed on the fringe corners of the internet. Like that bothers me. A lot of what I'm trying to do is use the credibility that I have to take these ideas, which for whatever reason, culture at the moment have been deemed inappropriate, even though I don't think they are inappropriate to talk about and try and give them more authenticity, more credibility so that they can become mainstream talking points. And we can actually start to make progress on that. Like, let's actually acknowledge that this look stuff is, is kind of real. Just as a pure strategy point of view from someone who feels like is generally on the same side as me, I, I, I just feel like that, that thing that people are pointing to saying, well, there's misogyny in there. I don't think that just pretending like it's not an issue or that, well, because I'm not personally part of it, I don't need to make a comment on it, is going to be enough to actually win over people in the mainstream. It's too easy for others to find enough negative kind of examples. And so I would rather not cede this ground to, to those misogynists and to those kind of extremists. But strategically, I think that the best thing to do is for more moderate creators to actually draw that line in the sand and say, no, I actively condemn that kind of like talk, that kind of uh, behavior. If you don't want to do that, that's, it's totally, totally fine. I just, if I'm right in thinking that you have a similar goal to me strategically, I would, but um, yeah, that, that's completely up to you. So what do you think like the solutions would be for that then? So like just one example, do you think it would be appropriate to like remove comments in your comment sections of your videos that appear misogynistic? Would that be an accept acceptable approach? I mean, even better would be to like, if you were passionate about it, to would be to actually engage with them and, and tell them, <laughs> like try and convince them that, that that's not the right thing to do or to tell them that you disagree or like I guess the strategy I've got in my channel is that I actively try and tell people like if you're here for woman bashing, go somewhere else. You know, there's so many channels yeah. on YouTube where you can find what you're looking for. Don't come to my place uh, to do it. Actively removing uh, comments, you could do that. You'd probably want to be upfront, like that. That's what, what you're would you doing. Sorry, do you think it would be a better solution to like address that comment, leave it where it is, and then either respond to it like directly as a reply or uh, bring it up in a video, say, hey, so I saw this comment on one of my videos and this, here is why it is wrong. Here is why it is misogynistic and I don't want this in my community or on my channel. I'm really glad you're, uh, you're asking me this because I feel like it's actually a good challenge because it's all well and good for me to just sort of say, hey, this is a good idea. But as you're pushing me to actually nut down on specific actions to take, I'm realizing that this is actually quite complex because the, the things that you just sort of said, I'm like, oh, no, he, he shouldn't have to do that. Like, that's not his responsibility. So maybe I'm, I'm not being totally, totally clear. But if you um, said about like trying to pull people into the community and, you know, it has those labels of misogyny, then like surely you would want to address uh, the people in the community and like kind of highlight and bring light to them that like you're not part of them and you actually call them out. You do a good job of calling them out and saying why it is wrong. I mean, it, it's, it depends what you're passionate about. It's something I'm personally passionate about. But so, yeah, I mean, I probably would do that. I guess what I'm realizing in the talking this through with you right now is that I actually don't think that you have a moral obligation to do that if you don't want to. As long as you're not being directly misogynistic, I guess I have a little bit of a thing of you using a label that other people are using like a, a label for. Like if, for example, if you said like there's the North American Zionist Institution and it was a pro-Jewish organization, but the acronym spelled out Nazis, you would expect at some point for them to be like, just by the way, we're not associated with those other Nazis. You know, just because if they're using that label, people are going to sort of expect that. So it was more that kind of medium, um, just like a token kind of gesture in that mindset, but more just talking to you right now, Wheat, rather than me saying, oh, you should do this, or I think you do that. I want to walk back that because like, I'm just thinking out loud here. I was more just curious where I really wanted to start from was just you personally as a guy, like, what do you think about that? Like, like, do you think that there's a reason why it attracts more of that kind of stuff? Have you noticed it? Does it bother you? Well, I think the main reason like people end up going down that path is like, because they've faced significant rejection in their life, or maybe they've um, 
or, or like if you take a look at MGTOW, um, a lot of men in that community after they've um, like gone through divorce and like they've lost like two thirds of their wealth, like they will go down that path of like hating women and uh, like thinking all of them are evil. Like, and it's easy to fall down that path. Like if you are like really hurt, either like financially, emotionally, or even physically, like it's easy to fall down that path. And I can see why they would go down that path, but mm. um, whether they, whether it is the right path, like I would kind of disagree. I don't think it would be right to like kind of just end up hating women because of what one or several women's actions um, like caused and kind of like slap a label on, onto like, the entire 3.5, billion women in the uh, world yeah definitely no I, I i'm this i'm the same this might be something that will just be interesting to sort of watch that space it might be a cool thing to like check back with you in sort of 12 months and sort of see where you're where you're feeling out there because it, it's something that i personally have to grapple with so i was just kind of curious i guess as like a fellow creator where you were sort of sitting with it at the moment um <laughs> i had another another question i wanted to ask you <laughs> is there a way to disagree with black pill people on any point without having them label your disagreements as cope? Oh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I've heard that argument many, many times. It's, it's often like when I see black pillars do that, like I often think it's like a uh, defense mechanism. And it's actually one of the things I dis dislike about the uh, black pill community and the way that they formulate their arguments because they often do um if they haven't got any actual data or evidence or something to say back to a person when they like bring up a promising point they would just say oh you're coping oh you're just a coper you just cope like they would just label it as cope um so i don't think that's the best approach that uh black pillars should take if they're going to make a um point with somebody and they're engaging in a discussion about their beliefs like they shouldn't just do that because like it's just easy it's like it's a bit pathetic really and they should actually try to formulate their points a bit better and bring up some actual evidence or data to say oh yeah no but have a look at this like this is this is a more accurate point of view oh wonderful answer i, I strongly strongly agree with you there before we finish up is there anything um that you want to ask me or so do you think that your channel is becoming more black build taking I a more black build approach I don't totally know what that that question um, means. I guess, or I'll simplify the question. Yeah. Like, do you think that um, the way current dating markets are playing out at the moment, do you think that the black pill is becoming more relevant? I can answer it by saying I think it should become more relevant. I personally, strategically, think that it's going to become bigger but only in the fringes and it's going to get more radicalized because i personally don't see any legitimate leadership um you know coming from the movement in an attempt to mainstream a fight what i what i do see and i'm glad to speak to you because i don't put you in this camp but and again it's a casual observation because i'm not really part of it but i see a lot of people i think very cynically exploiting the pain and misery of other people and not really looking at solutions and so while I think that there should be a movement towards understanding the very, very legitimate points that Black Pill are making, I don't think that strategically they're going about it the right way. Um, and so I don't, so, I don't I see it's likely to happen. So what would you say would be a more appropriate approach for Black Pill to take? Well, I'm obviously biased. I'd say my, my approach because that's what I'm, I'm taking. Because if you think, well, what do we have... In, in common, I, I don't dispute any of the data. So everything that the black pill would say, you know, that's scientifically backed up with regards to women's preferences for good looking men, I'm 100% on board with, but it's never going to be like the entirety of my focus. And so you can understand, you can talk about the same piece of information for completely different motivations, you know, like there's certainly an element of the black girl community that enjoys being miserable, that enjoys the state of victimhood and they escape into it as a means of shifting responsibility for their own failures in their own lives onto outside circumstances beyond their control. And then there are people who feed this narrative and it becomes incredibly toxic. And you've seen a number of times it becoming like violent, like almost like uh, terrorism. And I, I just think that that's uh, like, I, I, I really don't see that much effort being made to push against that tide. 
and it, it's a real shame to me because it seems to me like this really important set of data and this massively important piece of the puzzle when it comes to dating has been ceded to extremists and misogynists. And so what I would like to see are more credible mainstream people actively criticizing and rejecting the misogyny, but totally embracing the science, you know, bringing that into the mainstream. And my hope is that for those people who are currently lost in the doom and gloom despair, I'm ugly. So therefore my life is inherently going to be miserable and fuck women. They're all bitches. My hope is that when enough people in mainstream society actually recognize that their gripes all along were completely legitimate and that there's sympathy towards those people and it's dealt with as a real problem. Like we need to help these guys and need to acknowledge that, that that reduces their anger. And so as much as possible, I'm speaking to people who don't know that this is an issue and I'm trying to be like, Hey, do you know that this is an issue? And I always love when women in my personal life watch my content and they say things to me like, I had no idea that this was like what it's like for men. Now I'm talking about this to all of my girlfriends. You know, I have discussions about this stuff all the time. I'm like, yes, that's what I want. Not just people on the internet who have, you know, forced by circumstance to come across this stuff. Regular mainstream people, this becoming a talking point. That's my strategy. That's my hope. Yeah, yeah, it sounds good to look at more like a... Um solution sort of standpoint and um come at come at an angle that's more calm and uh, less misogynistic and from a factual standpoint that sounds good yeah look I, I, I think the science speaks for itself i think so much of what the black bill talks about is just completely undeniable but then my concern is that that's not what people are actually rejecting they're rejecting the culture that surrounds the science not the science itself and so i want that clear like demarcation and like I'll just be completely upfront it's it's a little bit nerve-wracking even speaking to you about this because when people watch this interview who are like really hardcore into that black bill stuff you just know like I've triggered them by saying the things that I've said and they're going to come with extreme hatred towards me I've got it plenty of times before and this is just going to bring up more Alex the 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 simp the blue pill coping you know, whatever fucking guy, he doesn't get it. He's in denial about his Norwood, you know, <laughs> rating or whatever like that. And it's like, oh, well, that's, that, that's the problem is it just, it feels to me like there's not a middle ground with the community where you can meet them halfway because they're so all or nothing. That's just the feeling I've had. And I honestly think that's the reason why more people don't try and, you know, adopt that label or engage with it because it just seems like, it's you're either with us or against us. That's the mindset that I feel like I've run into with these kind of people. Yeah. Sounds good. <laughs> yeah. Cool. <laughs> Did you have, um, th thank you so much for asking that question though. Was there anything else or should we wrap things up? No, that was all the questions I had for you. Tremendous. That was such an enjoyable conversation. I found that really, really interesting. I'm glad that we uh, got this opportunity to chat. Thank you for making that, that ratings video about my face without that. I never would have come across you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> No problem. Yeah, thanks a lot. I enjoyed, right. I enjoyed this conversation too. Yeah. Well, there will be um, like uh, information as to find out more about Wheat Waffles. He's referenced a bunch of his videos in this conversation. So if you want to find out more about him and where he's coming from, you can find out that information and maybe we'll chat again sometime in the future. Yeah, sounds, sounds really good. Thanks. All right. See you guys.